Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the podcast. In this one it's all about pulmonary fibrosis. It's a fairly long one but I'd like to cover a lot of topics. Now this episode about pulmonary fibrosis or lung scarring is dedicated to patients and people who may care for people who suffer with pulmonary fibrosis. I hope to make it as comprehensive as possible but it even if I will cover a lot of topics, and I'll tell you in a minute what we're going to cover, this does not uh, replace the advice you might get from your own healthcare team. So please, if you are suffering with pulmonary fibrosis, if you know someone who's suffering with pulmonary fibrosis, it's really important that you see your doctor, that you monitor the condition as, as they've indicated to you, because that's the best way to get optimum benefits. So when we talk about pulmonary fibrosis, we talk about lung scarring. But it's really, really important to figure out whether the fibrosis will get worse over time, whether it's progressive pulmonary fibrosis, or if it's non-progressive, it's, if it's the result of an injury to the lung or some other event in the past that has happened that's caused the fibrosis to occur, but that scar won't get worse. So it's really, really important. This is a key concept to understand, to make the difference between progressive pulmonary fibrosis and non-progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And along the way, I'll talk about causes, I'll talk about how the diagnosis is made in both cases, and the treatment. So hopefully this will be a good outline of the topic and fairly comprehensive to understand the context of pulmonary fibrosis, because I feel it's a topic of confusion. Uh, many patients, when they are diagnosed or someone tells them that they have pulmonary fibrosis, for example, they have a CT scan and someone mentions the word fibrosis. It can be scary, especially if you start looking online and you find information about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which we'll see in a minute is a specific type of pulmonary fibrosis, and many people might worry a lot. So I think I'd like to just, on the one hand, reassure those of you who have other forms of fibrosis and to let you know that there are many, many causes possible. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning it's really important to talk to your doctor to figure out what type of fibrosis you've got what's the prognosis, what are the investigations needed, what's the monitoring schedule, how often do you, know, go, do you need to go and see your doctor to see what's going on. So the first question to really ask is what is pulmonary fibrosis? So when we talk about scarring of the lungs, what do we mean by that? So if you think about a little cut that you get on your skin, you fall down, you cut your skin a little bit and then it heals but not in a, the proper way it doesn't completely go back to normal it leaves a little bit of a scar you can imagine that something similar may happen in the lungs you may have an injury to the lungs due to an infection for example and that leaves a little bit of a scar as it heals now in some people that little scar can be minimal it can be only on some portion of the lung where the infection was or it can happen spontaneously in different parts of the lungs at the same time. And what can happen in some cases is that that scar can progress. So it can get a little bit bigger over time. So this is where we talk about progressive pulmonary fibrosis. If we've got a bit of scarring on the lungs, which can be found on a chest CT scan, for example, and that scarring with time just progresses. And there can be many causes for that, and there can also be situations in which we don't know the cause. At the same time, however, most cases of pulmonary fibrosis or lung scarring do not progress. So in most cases, there's only a little bit of scarring on the lungs. That's the result of something that happened in the past, and that will not really get worse. If, however, your doctor mentions that in your case, there is a risk of the fibrosis progressing, it's really important to then establish the cause, to get a clear diagnosis as much as possible. Sometimes the diagnoses in this field can be very confusing because there's a lot of acronyms being used, a lot of confusing medical terminology, but it's really important more than that to follow things over time. So if there's a risk of progression, if the fibrosis has a chance of getting worse, and that can be sometimes inferred based on how it looks on the scan, based on your medical history, based on your occupational and environmental exposures, family history, a lot of things will matter when making a judgment of the risk of progression of the fibrosis. And depending on where you read the information, you may see that uh, some authors claim that there are over 200 causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Maybe there's some others will say over 100. Maybe some others will say well, I don't know, 50 or something like that. So you'll see various numbers being thrown around. 
The number is less important, the precise number is less important, because we always find new causes. And sometimes the causes can be very, very obscure. Within a certain condition, you may have different sub-causes or things like that, or different triggers. So that's really less important, but it's it's a good idea to have some broad picture understanding of what the cause is because you may have different types of terminology being used. First, I'd like to mention just about causes of pulmonary fibrosis that are generally non-progressive. So these, this is usually something that occurs after a severe chest infection. Now, it could be a severe pneumonia, but more often it can be a specific infection such as tuberculosis. So tuberculosis in some countries around the world is actually quite common. And if it's caught a little bit late, or if the treatment wasn't started um, as early as it should be, the tuberculosis can be actually quite extensive. And as it heals, it can leave quite a lot of scarring on the lungs. Now, the good news is that in most cases, tuberculosis scars don't really progress. They don't really get worse over time. However, if they are quite extensive, they can still pose a little bit of a problem because it can lead to breathlessness and fatigue, coughing, things like that. So extensive fibrosis is a problem in itself. Even though it doesn't progress, it may cause debilitating symptoms. And with fibrosis, because it's a piece of scar tissue in the lungs, it doesn't really go away. So the only way to really improve symptoms of breathlessness afterwards is really to try to um, attend pulmonary rehabilitation classes, exercises for the lungs, work with a physiotherapist, keep active, and maybe sometimes there can be some medical treatments that can be tried, but they are not as useful as we one may hope. So when we talk about tuberculosis, about pneumonias, severe infections of the lungs, it's really important to try to catch these early because we don't really want to get to the point where we have extensive fibrosis that we cannot reverse. Sometimes you may also have people who have spent some time in an intensive care unit because of some other condition that was fairly, fairly severe. And if you suffer with acute respiratory distress syndrome, so ARDS. This is a situation that can sometimes be associated with fibrosis. So the person will get past that really severe situation in their life, but they may actually come out of the intensive care unit after having spent maybe a week, a month there with small amounts of scarring on the lung, which may not completely go away, but generally it shouldn't progress. However, it should probably still be monitored as a complication of that intensive care stay. Fibrosis can also be caused by environmental factors. So things around us, things that we breathe into the lungs. And here there are different, different subtypes and it can affect a lot of people. You can have a lot of people who suffer with pulmonary fibrosis, because they've worked, for example, in a mine, they've been mining coal or inhaling all kinds of dust in, in mines. They may be, have been working on various construction sites. They may have worked with asbestos. So asbestos is a very common cause of pulmonary fibrosis. So all of these materials that we inhale as dusts or fibers or things like that, they can actually cause pulmonary fibrosis if we don't use the appropriate respiratory protection to prevent those little particles from entering the lungs and depositing themselves in the lungs. Because that will trigger some sort of a reaction from the body. And as it heals, as it's trying to get rid of, eliminate all this dust, all these fibers that we've inhaled, it may actually lead to small amounts of scarring. Well, small amounts, but they can sometimes be quite extensive depending on how much dust was inhaled. So it's really important to keep that in mind if you work in an environment where you're not really um, breathing in clean air. Always try to ask for respiratory protection from your employers to use the appropriate masks if you cannot ventilate the space well. If you are exposed to a lot of dust, for example, if you're working on a construction site and you're doing stone cutting, that's really, really dangerous sometimes because a lot of people may feel that the mask is actually not allowing them to breathe because it may be too hot outside. But if you're actually inhaling all that dust every day, it can actually cause fibrosis either by its itself by depositing itself in the lungs or sometimes by causing a little bit of an inflammatory reaction in the lungs as the lungs are trying to get rid of the dust that you've inhaled. So all of these factors can actually lead to pulmonary fibrosis. 
And sometimes you don't even need to be in such harsh environments. Sometimes it can be a predisposition. Some people may be predisposed to having a hypersensitivity reaction to something in the environment. And this is where it could literally be anything. So some people may react to bird proteins. So for example, those who keep birds, they keep chickens, they keep parrots, budgies, etc. Sometimes they can be sensitized and the low-grade exposure to the bird being in the house or in the garden can actually lead to the development of pulmonary fibrosis in a condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a condition that's really bizarre because it can be caused by other things as well. It can be caused by various molds that we inhale. It can be caused by having a humidifier in, in the house that's sort of blowing out a little bit of moldy air. It could be something that occurs in farm workers, those who work with compost, those who um, <laughs> grow mushrooms, some people who do a lot of wood cutting from the sawdust. So all of these things can sometimes be triggers for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And usually if you've got a low-grade trigger over a long period of time, so it's something you work with day by day, you can actually develop chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a low-grade inflammation in the lungs that over a period of years leads to the development of pulmonary fibrosis. And the biggest worry here is that it can sometimes mimic other forms of fibrosis. So sometimes doctors, when we diagnose, as doctors, when we diagnose pulmonary fibrosis, we look at the pattern of the scarring as it looks like on this chest CT scan. And sometimes it can be really, really confusing because the patterns tend to overlap, especially in more severe cases. So I would say it's always really, really important, even if you've got a known cause for the fibrosis, even if you know what's been going on, always keep an eye out for things in the environment, especially if in those cases where we'll see later, there are cases of pulmonary fibrosis where we don't really have a known cause. We don't really know exactly what's triggered it. So that's when it's really important to work with your doctor, to try to ask a lot of questions, to look around the house, have, have a little bit of a diary, to look around and note things that may you may be inhaling, things that may be triggering your your breathlessness, triggering a cough, triggering a wheeze, things like that, because they may hold the key to diagnosing a condition as bizarre as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this is really, really important. And the treatment in that situation, the first treatment is to remove the trigger. And that can sometimes stop the, stop the progression of fibrosis. The other major thing that we need to consider is that sometimes you can get lung scarring secondary to having another condition in the body. So this is mostly when we talk about autoimmune conditions, connective tissue diseases, systemic disorders. So these things you may have heard of before. So just to give you a couple of examples, rheumatoid arthritis is a common one. The other one would be scleroderma or otherwise known as systemic sclerosis. These are two conditions in which are actually quite often associated with pulmonary fibrosis, not in the majority of cases, but there can be a uh, you know, a quite large minority of uh, patients who suffer with these conditions who actually develop pulmonary fibrosis. And the more the condition goes on for, generally there's high risk for developing these uh, sort of uh, complications in the lungs as well. Even though these are conditions that affect the skin, the joints, they may have, on first at first glance, have nothing to do with the lungs, with the pulmonary fibrosis, but there is sometimes a link. And usually what happens is because you've got infl specific types of inflammation driven by certain antibodies, by proteins that are secreted by your body abnormally and which attack the healthy tissues as well, you may get inflammation, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis in the joints, but a similar form of inflammation happens in the lungs as well. So you may get problems there. And over time, that inflammation left unchecked, left untreated, can lead to scarring of the lungs. And of course, there are many, many others um, that can be considered here. Many other autoimmune conditions. You can have conditions like myositis, antisynthetase syndrome, mixed connective tissue disease. All of these things can be associated sometimes with pulmonary fibrosis. And actually, as part of the workup, you'll see in a second, we do a lot of blood tests to try to rule out as many of these potential causes as we can. And finally, if we've tried to look at the environment 
We've looked at other potential systemic conditions such as autoimmune disease. We've uh, ruled out the, any history of severe infections. We can't really put our finger on what is really going on. Sometimes we cannot really find the cause. So we try, we try, we try, we do a workup. And if we cannot find a known cause for the fibrosis and the fibrosis has specific patterns on the CT scan, sometimes that can be called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. So that just means lung scarring of an undetermined cause. So when we have IPF, that is a condition in itself. And it's really important that, to know, to be aware that this condition e exists, pulmonary fibrosis, lung scarring of an undetermined cause, it just seems to come out of the blue. Because it is a progressive form of fibrosis. And it requires generally specific treatments that aim to slow down the progression of the disease. We cannot reverse it. It tends to progress over time. It has a fairly grim prognosis sometimes, but the sooner we intervene with treatment, the better. So this is why it's really, really important when someone suffers with pulmonary fibrosis is to define how the fibrosis looks like, what are the likely causes, to try to find the cause as much as possible, to dig as much as we can into the patient's history, into the person's um, environmental causes and triggers, occupation, any kinds of uh, conditions they may suffer from, because finding the cause allows us to treat the fibrosis specifically, to treat the process that has been actually leading to the fibrosis. Because otherwise, when we're in this nasty situation where we don't know what we're treating, but we have progressive fibrosis. And that's when the treatments are only aimed to slow things down over time. And sometimes we'll talk about the treatment in a second. Things are fairly complicated, but there's a lot of research in the field. So this is just to give you a little bit of optimism that there is work in progress to try to find better treatments, either for the inflammatory conditions, which can cause pulmonary fibrosis, or for the fibrosis itself to slow it down or to stop it. But it all depends on a case-by-case -case basis. So this is why it's important to talk to your doctor to see, in your case, what's going on. And generally, it won't be only your doctor. It will be a whole team trying to care for your case, for someone who suffers with pulmonary fibrosis, because as you'll see in a second, it's fairly complicated to provide everything that's required. And you may actually need to travel to see physicians in a larger unit, in a larger center, where they have all of these cases coming together. They have the expertise. They have the capabilities to actually care for cases of pulmonary fibrosis as well. So we've talked a little bit about the causes. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how the diagnosis is made. What are the sort of the tests that are required? So first of all, when we identify pulmonary fibrosis, sometimes it can be identified on a simple chest x-ray done for another reason. However, more often, that is not enough because a simple chest x-ray generally just gives us a simple image of the lungs. It doesn't have enough resolution to try to determine the pattern of fibrosis. So normally we require a specific form of computed tomography, which is a high resolution computed tomography or high resolution CT or HRCT. So this is actually the investigation that is required to make a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis correctly. And it's really the basis of identifying the pattern if it suggests inflammation, if it suggests a certain cause, we can monitor the condition over time. So the, the CT scan of the chest, especially the high resolution one, is really important to try to make a proper diagnosis. Other tests that are done may involve various respiratory tests, various breathing tests, lung function testing. Normally, a simple spirometry can give us some indication whether the lungs are restricted, they have a there's a restrictive pattern on the spirometry, which again is consistent with pulmonary fibrosis. But we may also perform something called a gas transfer factor or a DLCO or TLCO, something like that. So that is another form of lung function testing. It's done usually around the same time when the spirometry is done, when we blow into a tube as forcefully as we can. But with the gas transfer, it's a slightly different maneuver on a different type of machine. Uh, and this gives us an indication of how quickly oxygen passes through the lungs into the blood. And that's really important to determine the extent of the fibrosis and how much it's really affecting 
the transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide and how you, well you're able to breathe and how well your lungs are operating. So both the spirometry and the gas transfer factor are really key components of the investigations in terms of breathing tests. And of course, on a case-by-case -case basis, your doctor may request other lung function tests as well, which sometimes may include a walk test to try to determine if, for example, when you're walking, how far you can go, before you, your oxygen levels may drop. You may actually have a proper oxygen assessment to determine whether your oxygen levels are normal at rest or when you're doing the walk tests on exertion. So all of these things can be, can be done as part of the respiratory tests or the breathing test, the lung function testing. Now, if there is a suspicion that there is a form of progressive pulmonary fibrosis and we fear it may progress, we don't have a clear cause, your doctor may actually consider doing some blood tests. So this is also some for routine reasons to, to figure out whether your kidneys, your liver is working well, whether there's any infection that can be identified, but also to screen for autoimmune disease. So I remember if, I'm, if you remember, I mentioned that in conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, or scleroderma, Sjogren's, all kinds of autoimmune conditions, we can identify some antibodies, some autoantibodies is it's a better term, in the blood. So these are little proteins, antibodies produced by the immune system, but they are specific to even healthy tissues. So they affect the own healthy tissues of the body. So the immune system goes a little bit into overdrive and specifically targets different components of the body. And these are called autoantibodies when they react to our own tissues. And we can sometimes screen for those with a blood test, normally done when you're not being treated with anti-inflammatory drugs such as corticosteroids, high doses of corticosteroids. And then we, we tend to identify potential causes. It can sometimes give us an idea whether there's an undiagnosed connective tissue disease or autoimmune disease, as I mentioned. So this is one test that may be done. Normally, after this battery of tests is completed, after a good clinical history has been collected, uh, your doctor will probably sit down with some other doctors in the hospital, be it a radiologist, most, most commonly, potentially a rheumatologist, potentially a lung pathologist, and they will have what is called an MDT or a multidisciplinary team discussion. And in this discussion, basically, all the details of the case will be presented and the most likely diagnosis will try to be established. If based on the chest CT scan, the breathing tests, and the blood tests, we can identify a cause, or we are fairly confident that we have made a diagnosis that is a good working diagnosis that allows us to prescribe specific treatments, we generally leave it at that when we start the monitoring process. We try to prescribe any treatments if necessary, or if we don't feel there's any chance of progression, you may actually be discharged at this point. However, in some cases, based on this discussion or based on your doctor's suspicions initially, you may need to undergo some other tests. One such test is a bronchoscopy. So a bronchoscopy is a camera test for the lungs where a little camera at the end of a tube goes down into the airway under local anesthetic and usually sedation. And we tend to look around and we try to collect a little bit of fluid from deeper within the lungs. We tend to put a bit of fluid in and wash a small segment of the lung and aspirate that fluid back up because that allows us to collect any inflammatory cells that are lingering in the lung. So by looking at that cell count of what sort of inflammatory cells are in deep within the lungs, we can sometimes tell whether there's a lot of inflammation there, a lot of active inflammation, thus suggests that there's an inflammatory cause for the fibrosis. And that can sometimes give us an indication, because this is actually a big fork in the road, whether we have an inflammatory type of fibrosis or a non-inflammatory type of fibrosis. Because regardless of the label that we'll end up putting on, on the diagnosis, if we have inflammation in the lungs, we will treat generally with anti-inflammatory medications, such as corticosteroids, such as prednisone, prednisolone, things like that. But if we do have fibrosis, but there's no sign of inflammation, even when we do the bronchoscopy or when we look at the imaging, there's no suggest 
suggestion that there's anything inflammatory going on, then either we don't really have a good treatment to go on, or we will try to treat with antifibrotic medication, which just basically means that we give medications that aim to slow down the progress of the disease. And even when we've done all these tests, sometimes we may be in the position where we still don't know what the diagnosis is. And in rare cases, a lung biopsy may be required. Now, this can sometimes be obtained via bronchoscopy, via a minimally invasive camera test, or sometimes it may require a small surgical approach to take a little bit of tissue from the lung that can be sent to the lab and to try to determine exactly what is going on and what is causing the fibrosis. Because if we find the right cause, like I said before, we are able usually to treat in a better way and we have a better idea of what the long-term prognosis and implications are. So we've talked a little bit about the causes of pulmonary fibrosis. We've talked a little bit about how the diagnosis is usually found. Now, I'd like to go into the treatment part of things. How is pulmonary fibrosis treated? Is it always necessary to treat or not? And if so, with what medications and what other things are required? Because the medication is actually only a small part of the treatment that's required. So first of all, if at the end of all the tests, your doctors feel fairly confident that there's no risk of progression, generally, everything is left at that. It's depending on how significant the fibrosis is, you may only require symptomatic treatment to deal with bothersome symptoms such as a cough or breathlessness. So that can sometimes be treated by using anything but the treatment. So all of these will be common, all of the measures that I will outline uh, next. Some of them will be common for all forms of fibrosis, but sometimes the treatments are required when there is a progressive form of fibrosis. So the first thing is whether you need a regular checkup with your doctor, a regular follow-up with your doctor. If the likelihood of pulmonary fibrosis progressing are very low and there isn't a lot of fibrosis on the lung, it's just a small little finding, then probably there's no need to have a long-term follow-up. And you would then maybe just periodically see your doctor if there's any need to do so. However, in most other cases, most doctors would probably recommend an ongoing follow-up, which could be maybe every three months in more severe cases, or maybe just once a year to potentially do another breathing test, another lung function, and see if things are remaining stable. It depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes, Imaging may be repeated after a certain length of time just to determine if anything has changed. So, for example, you may undergo another chest CT scan one year or two years after the initial diagnosis just to make sure that things are stable and steady and nothing new has occurred. So, sometimes in those situations, we may just observe and no treatment specifically for the fibrosis may be provided. As long as you have the regular follow-up, that's a good safety net and we can always revisit the diagnosis if there is new information that occurs. You may actually think of something new. You may uncover something about your workplace, about your home, that could have been a trigger for the fibrosis. But if you are feeling well, if things are stable, it's probably nothing to worry about, just to see your doctor every now and then to make sure that things are still fine. So in most cases of pulmonary fibrosis, just careful of observation over time, regular checkups with your doctor are really the basis from which we start. So I think that's the first order of business. The second order of business is whether we can eliminate the cause. So if we have a suspicion that the fibrosis is progressive, is going to get worse over time, there's something that's really triggering it from the environment, something from the environment, from our workplace, from our lifestyle, we need to consider stopping that. And sometimes this can be really hard to, to do, especially if, for example, the fibrosis can be caused by excessive smoking, because it actually can be. We have smoking-related interstitial lung disease. It's something that we know exists. So, for example, in that situation, if the, the patient is quite young, they may feel like, oh, there's no need to, to actually stop smoking, I still feel well. But with, with fibrosis, it's really important to understand that it's one of these conditions where we need to think long term. We need to think of the implications over a long period of time. So you may be feeling well now, but what will be 
the situation in five years, ten years from now. If you have a family, if you need to support your your children, um, you know, all these things need to play a role in all kinds of treatments decisions that you will make. You, you'll make. You need to to be quite careful about how you play things long term. So, for example, if your job demands that you do activities in which you inhale large amounts of dust. Now, it's really important to try to either wear the appropriate protection or even better to try to envisage changing your profession if you can, because that's not a great situation. The best way to prevent further worsening in your condition is to prevent being exposed to more and more of the triggers. So for example, if you're working with certain animals and that's found to be the cause of pulmonary fibrosis, or if you keep any birds at home, they may be very cute. You may have an emotional connection with your parrots, for example, and that's something that we've seen in, in our practice. And it's really hard to, to give up the birds, but sometimes they need to be rehoused because otherwise it just may end up driving the fibrosis, making you feel worse and worse and worse. Um, I mentioned smoking briefly. In all cases of pulmonary fibrosis, it's really important to eliminate smoking if you can, to try to approach smoking cessation services, to seek help if you cannot sp stop smoking. And this is not a judgment in any way. I'm just saying that it's really important to stop smoking because it's an extra trigger, an extra irritant that may actually drive certain fibrotic processes in the lung. And it's really important to just stop if you can. Then, as part of the treatment, we need to consider potentially treating the cause if we have inflammation. So if we've got active inflammation in the lungs that may be triggered by for example, an autoimmune condition. Eliminating the cause may mean that we treat the autoimmune condition with anti-inflammatory medications to keep it in check, and that will help treat the lungs as well. And this is where we get again to that fork in the road. Are we talking about a fibrosis that is inflammatory in nature or just simply fibrosis? Because that will guide our treatment decisions somewhat. So if there's an inflammatory cause that's found, if there's potential progression of the fibrosis, in that case, we will probably need to treat the inflammation. So if we've got active inflammation, usually the first treatment that's tried is a trial of corticosteroids. So usually something like prednisone, prednisolone, depending on where you are in the world, there may be different medications that will be tried with the same effect, corticosteroids. Or potentially, if you are seeing a rheumatologist or some other specialist for the autoimmune condition, you may just have to follow their recommendations and they will work together with your pulmonologist, with your lung doctor, to determine what's the best treatment in that case. And the treatment with anti-inflammatory agents aims to re eliminate the inflammation in the lungs, the inflammation that is actually driving this fibrotic process. In most cases, that allows the, fibro the fibrosis to stop getting worse. And this is really the goal of treatment. We aim to achieve stability. Now, on the other hand, if we only have fibrosis, we don't really know the cause, and we potentially give a working diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where I just mentioned that this is a diagnosis where we have lung scarring of an unknown, undetermined cause. But we know that it may progress. So in that case, we usually try to treat with uh, something called antifibrotic agents. So we've, I've mentioned this before. There are two medications which are available in the world, which are approved currently in January 2023. One of them is called nintedanib or OFEV, and the other one is called pyrfenidone or esbriat. Now, both of these medications, they work by reducing the rate of uh, worsening in the fibrosis. They don't reverse the fibrosis, unfortunately, but they do give some sort of stability in the sense that uh, the lung function decline over the years is less pronounced. So it buys us time for a longer life where we can actually feel better because if the fibrosis is progressing really quickly, you can imagine you can get into a situation where you will require maybe oxygen, you'll feel more and more breathless, the symptoms will get worse. So we try to prevent that for as long as possible. And that's why introducing these medications early, even though they don't reverse the fibrosis, they may not make you feel better. Over time, over three years, five years, you may actually have a big effect. So this is really, really important to consider if you'd be eligible for these treatments based on your diagnosis. Now, 
of the two medications, one of them, which is called nintedinib or OFEV, so this one actually is indicated for not only pure idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So it can sometimes be used based on results of more recent research in all kinds of fibrosis that is progressive. So if it meets certain criteria, for example, your lung function drops by a certain amount over the last two years, there's been worsening in your symptoms and your imaging is getting worse. So the, the amount of scarring that we can see on a chest CT scan is worsening over time, over the last two years usually. Generally, that medication can be prescribed as an add-on therapy to whatever else you've been given for the main cause. So for example, if you suffer with an inflammatory style, type of fibrosis, for example, in the context of rheumatoid arthritis, you are on maximum treatment for rheumatoid arthritis from your rheumatologist who is treating your joints for, for the rheumatoid arthritis, you may still be prescribed nintedinib on top of that to try to slow down the progression of the, the condition. If you are on max therapy for your joints, for the anti-inflammatories, and the fibrosis is still worsening despite that treatment, the lungs are still getting worse, there is this option to actually introduce the antifibrotic agent as well to try to slow things down. So that's really useful in some cases. But we need to be mindful that sometimes um, we may run into some issues. Now, both pyrfenidone and nintedinib, they're not perfect drugs, so they both have some potential side effects. Now, normally for nintedinib, many patients do complain sometimes of having quite significant diarrhea, so that can be sometimes managed with anti-diarrhea medication such as loperamide. Now, on the other hand, on the, um, on the side of the pyrfenidone, there is um, some digestive disturbance usually in the sense of loss of appetite or things like that and so there can be photosensitivity so people may become a little bit sensitive to, to bright sunlight so they'll need to wear sunblock so all of these things are actually just potential side effects that can can occur with with the two medications not everyone gets the side effects not everyone will get all the side effects that are mentioned in the leaflet most patients tolerate both birfenidone and nintedinib quite well but it's just a matter of counseling you on an individual basis. So if you if you need to be prescribed these medications, generally you would need to, to have a counseling session with either your doctor or a specialist nurse or some other health professional who knows these medications well and can provide a lot of sort of um, information before you actually go on them to know what to expect and how to manage any potential complications along the way. But there is more to the treatment than just drugs. So the other thing that we need to consider is oxygen therapy. So we've talked about things to treat the causes of the fibrosis and to reduce its rate of progression if it's progressive. But oxygen is also really, really important because oxygen is a form of treatment. Now, many people mistakenly think that oxygen is a treatment for breathlessness and actually it's not necessarily going to be very effective in managing breathlessness. However, when we give oxygen, we tend to give oxygen to correct low levels in the blood. So if the oxygen, oxygen levels are quite low in the, in the blood, giving the extra oxygen allows your organs to operate at a normal blood oxygen level. And that's really important because it prevents your your organs such as your heart, your muscles, operating in, non -efficient, in a non-efficient way. So working in an anaerobic way, because that is a very energy poor um, way of operating. And it leads to a lot of strain on the heart, a lot of strain on the muscles and other organs of the body. And it uh, can actually accelerate the decline in other parts of the body. So we may start with the fibrosis that leads to low oxygen and the low oxygen hits the heart and other organs of the body and then that accelerates a vicious circle of decline. So the oxygen is really important in breaking that. But not everyone needs oxygen. Some people may not need oxygen, they may be absolutely fine. They may be breathless, they may struggle with breathlessness a lot, but oxygen may not be the right therapy for them. So it's really important to talk to your doctor and see if that's really what's needed. And in most cases, in pulmonary fibrosis, initially oxygen is prescribed on an ambulatory basis. So only when needed. So for example, if someone's planning to do something really strenuous, they want to 
lift some heavy weight for, for some reason. They're working around the house, they go for an extra long walk. There is portable oxygen sometimes that can be provided. So that can help when you're actually needing it the most, when your oxygen levels do drop, to have a little bit of extra. For the breathlessness and for the symptoms, it's a whole different story because there can be other things that we can try. So for example, if you are suffering with breathlessness a lot, in that case, sometimes different strategies may help. So you may find some benefit from certain medications. So sometimes opioid medication can help with breathlessness sometimes, but sometimes it can be a matter of um, being aware of your breathing. So having some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy or some sort of psychological counseling on how to deal with breathlessness is really, really important. Because if you can imagine, when you suffer with lung scarring, the lungs are a little bit harder than before. They're, they will not be as stretchy as before. So you'll find it a little bit harder to breathe in. Being aware of that fact is really important because you won't panic if you're suddenly becoming a little breathless. And this is a little, it's, it's something that really happens a lot in patients who suffer with pulmonary fibrosis because they start to breathe heavily. They start to panic because they feel breathless and that accelerates the breathing and it just leads to a very unpleasant situation. So knowing how to be aware of that and sort of to have techniques to psychological techniques to actually get on top of that situation and control the breathing is really, really important. And of course, long-term breathlessness can lead to issues with anxiety. So this is again something that you should bring up with your doctor if you're struggling with anxiety, with depression, because there may be treatments that can help with that. They can actually improve your quality of life. Even if fibrosis is a very difficult condition to live with, if you have a decent quality of life, you're still able to enjoy good times and fa good family moments, it's still something that's positive. So life with pulmonary fibrosis is not easy, but by really taking good care of uh, overall health, dealing with the symptoms, for example, if someone's dealing with a troublesome cough, there may be treatments for the cough. The cough may be tri triggered sometimes not only by the fibrosis, it can be triggered by um, acid reflux from the stomach, it can be triggered from untreated uh, post-nasal drip or pro issues with the with the nose so so just a runny nose a constantly runny nose maybe requires a little bit of treatment and that can improve the cough so dealing with all kinds of symptoms in pulmonary fibrosis can be done it may require cooperation with other sort health professionals which you may not consider it's very important to see a physiotherapist it's very important to do pulmonary rehabilitation or exercises for your breathing run by professionals in this field so it's really really important to, to try to integrate all of these things into the treatment algorithm it's not just the medication sometimes there may be instances where the medication may not be indicated there may be risks associated with going on the various medications that i've uh, suggested for the pulmonary fibrosis we may not be able to give you the maximum medication pharmacologically but that doesn't mean that all the treatment must stop there are symptomatic treatments for the cough for the breathlessness these you can discuss with your doctor on a case-by-case -case basis then there is also the pulmonary rehabilitation so going on the exercise programs will help you strengthen the respiratory muscles will help you maintain your breathing function so over the long period of time going on oxygen if you need oxygen that can really help and there are even other things such as fan therapy so fan therapy is something really interesting because it just involves using a handheld fan uh, so just like an electric spinning fan that blows a little bit of air and that airflow actually has been found to be beneficial for many people who suffer with pulmonary fibrosis or chronic respiratory disease because instead of providing a little bit of oxygen that can come out of a concentrator that fan just blows a larger amount of air towards your face so just directing that to your towards your face and your airways can actually give you a sense of relief from the breathlessness it can help you cope with a moment of panic when your breathing becomes a little bit more labored than before so just using that fan can be a simple solution sometimes for for breathing and there are many many other such solutions uh, for coughing sometimes just um, having a little sweet lozenge uh, 
in your mouth can just soothe the throat a little bit and stop the coughing if you don't really want to go for a pharmacological solution by taking codeine or something like that. So there are quite a lot of things that can be done. I think it's also really, really important at the same time to talk to your doctor about seeing other relevant specialists. So if you are suffering with any associated conditions, any other illnesses that require treatment, if you're on if you need, for example, high blood pressure tablets or anything of that nature, that will help as well to control the decline in other organs over time. So it's really important to just treat any other associated conditions at the same time, to not just think that pulmonary fibrosis is a sole condition. We need to have a very holistic approach. And in that regard, also, you can sometimes move away from only the typical medical practice. If you can attend support groups and talk to other patients and be a member of a patient association, a patient support group, a patient advocacy, those are things that can give you a lot of energy and a lot of courage to fight this terrible condition. And last but not least, it's important to not forget that there is research ongoing in to finding a cure for pulmonary fibrosis and to finding a way to stop this condition. So if, for example, you would want to take part in research, in clinical trials, it's something that I would say is really important to help benefit not only yourself, but others as well. You may have access to newer medication. You may have access to newer devices to help monitor your condition at home, to be in touch with your doctor more often, to be in touch with the research team. So all of these things are really important and they all play a role. So in this episode, we've talked a little bit about what is pulmonary fibrosis, what is progressive versus non-progressive from pulmonary fibrosis. And this is a key concept to understand in your case or in uh, the case of someone you care about if they are really at risk of becoming worse with the fibrosis. We've talked a little bit about causes. We've talked about the, how the diagnosis is made and about the holistic approach to treatment that doesn't only involve medications, but also a lot of other measures. It's not a comprehensive overview, but I hope it's fairly thorough and it covers some of the more important topics that I hope you will um, get to research a little bit more when, when you do your own research online, when you talk to your doctor. I hope it's a good starting point for a conversation. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you'll come back for future episodes. All the best.